Hey, Shalom Israel, Most High in Christ bless you. Hey, it's that time again. We need you to subscribe to the IUIC Phoenix YouTube page, all right? So make sure you go ahead and subscribe right now. We need your help. Shalom. So, man, I had so much thoughts from the Passover. And then, of course, leadership, we have meetings, we have discussions about things. Um, and literally, it's about, if you think about it, taking over the world, right? Like how we get the kingdom back. And it's, and it's pretty intense. So my mind's been all over the place. My spirit's been all over the place. Um, I'm going to focus. This is for everybody, but this is going to be for the men. All right, this is going to be for the men. All right, so the topic is called, Are You Ready for the Battle? Let's start at Numbers 31. Uh, my aim is to try to put this in perspective, and maybe reinforce for brothers who see the vision, and for those who don't, uh, maybe put in perspective what this is really about, because I think a lot of people think they know and they don't move in the right spirit. So we'll see. Numbers 31, and let's start at 1. The book of Numbers, chapter 31, and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward thou shalt be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves. He says, Arm some of yourselves. All right? Emphasis on some. As I expound upon the class, you'll understand why. He said, Arm some of yourselves. Come on. Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Read on. Of every tribe a thousand, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send to the war. Right. So he said, not everybody that's a man is going to go to the war. Not everybody that's male is going to go to the war. Right. Hold on to those thoughts. Come on. Verse 5. So there were delivered out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand of every tribe, 12,000 armed for war. So 12,000 were armed for war. So it was not all the men. It was only 12,000. And I say that because I think sometimes there's an expectation that some of you brothers have that all of you are going to war. And some of you will not. And guess who ultimately decides that? God does. God decides who goes to the battle, right? But it's based on your actions. It's based on a spirit that's seen for that. And, and I'm going over this topic because, again, I mentioned that there's meetings, there's discussions. We are stepping up our warfare. Now, for the sake of uh, not giving out the playbook, because you got people who are going to watch what we say there, some stuff is going to be brought out in detail offline as to how we're moving when it comes to promotions, ranks, things of that nature, all right? And it's brilliant. And it's going to make us better on all fronts, and it's going to make us more effective on all fronts and how we roll in that spirit, all right? Uh, so it was only 12,000. Now, how many men were there in the wilderness? Because this was in the wilderness. So how many men were there? In the wilderness, that only 12,000 were sent. Anybody know? Anybody want to take a stab? Nobody got the history? No, before you do, Officer Tobias. Anybody else? Negative, okay. What do you got, Officer Tobias? I was going to say millions. Mm -hmm. I want a scripture that says how many men there were in the wilderness. Let's get Exodus 12 and 37. There were millions of us, but there were not millions of men. Come on. The book of Exodus, chapter 12 and verse 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. Right. So meaning besides the children, besides the women, 600,000 men came out of Egypt. 
And who went to battle against the Midianites? 12,000, not even 10%, not even 5% of the men. Just to kind of get you set of the proper expectations you should have for yourself and how God moves in his army. He said, he sent 12, what is that, like 3%, two and change, or two flat? Two flat, 2%. 2% of the men went to war. And the Most High always did it with little numbers, right? For, for, for time's sake, I didn't go to the scriptures for it. But in Judges, when Gideon went to the battle, right, he kept whittling it down, whittling it down. He said, you know what? Uh, these guys that are married and have this, send them back. These guys that are like this, send them back. All right, now that what you have left here, let's see out of this bunch how their spirit rolls. The ones that lap the water such and such a way, send them back. The others, those are the ones you're going to go and get the victory with. When we read about many are called but few are chosen, it does not just mean who's going to make it. It also goes within how things are divvied up as far as what's needful. I got to tell you, it's the same in the military. How many are really officers that command the troops? It's different, right? You ever heard the term, uh, uh, too many chiefs, not enough Indians? There needs to be a balance, and God sets that balance of what's the right amount of men that are going to be leaders to lead the people to victory. Let's get Ezekiel 34 and 30. And it is men. It's not to say that sisters don't have a role in any of this, but it's the men that's going to get the victory. And that's for you sisters to really let that sink in. It's for the men that's going to bring forth the kingdom of heaven by setting the expectations and following the program that God has set forth. Christ is going to be the one that's going to deliver it. But to get us to that point, it's going to take a certain type of man that the Most High has numbered. And he loves numbers, not in quantity, but in significance and what they represent. He sent 12,000 to battle out of 600,000. Why? And they were all equally represented from each tribe, 1,000 from each tribe. Said 12,000 from each tribe. Like I said, for time's sake, I wanted to do like visuals, show you the ranks. I was going to show the structure in order. If life lasts, I'll do it on a Sabbath class. If not, maybe it bleeds into a show. We'll see. Let's get Ezekiel 34 and 30. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 34 and verse 30. Thus shall, ye, shall they know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. Right, so all Israel's is God's people. Later, we're going to read about a mixed multitude that includes the children, the women, other men who were not called to the warfare. All right, come on, read. Verse 31, and ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men. Are what? Are men. Are what? Are men. Are men. Come on. And I am your God, saith the Lord and God. And what type of God do we serve? Exodus 15 and 3. Exodus 15 and 3. The book of Exodus, chapter 15 and verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. So he tells you that he is a man, and not just any man, but he is a man of war. So to be godlike, we serve a God of war. For all you game heads, right? We serve a God of war. Meaning he's about battle. He likes conflict. You read that in Ezra's, uh, is it 2nd Ezra 6? Uh, I recently brought it out where uh, I know we go to 6 and 9 to say Jacob's uh, the beginning and Esau's the end. But when you read from 1, he tells you that his whole game plan and his battle that was set was betwixt a controversy, a conflict between Jacob and Esau. All right? I'm summarizing it, but that's essentially what uh, he says in 2nd, when you read 1 through, I think, 10. Right. He says, this is the condition of the battle. This is how it's set. This is what I ordained. So anyway, he moves our mind in trying to be have a Godhead mentality should be thinking war, should be thinking battle. And I emphasize that because. It's a small number 
that are war minded, but the majority can help let their mindset seep into the war minded men if you let it. And what I mean by that is that some of y'all still, okay, how many years you profess to be in this? Some of you like to add years, right? You don't like to count when you were down and out, right? You like to just, like, if there's some continuity and, you know, they, they, it don't matter that I, I might have not been congregating or I might not have been here. I've been in the truth this long. No, no, you went back and you start over, right? You try to count. Sisters do that stuff too. You try to add more years than what. Your, your time in the truth don't start till you were congregating because that's a whole new level. And those of you who know what I'm talking about, those of you who were watching on the side for a year, it was a whole different thing when you came into the body and what it meant to be in this walk. And I started with the example of that Passover because I said, I know for some of you it's overwhelming to see what's real. You know we're an exceeding great army, but what you experience daily is a couple hundred people in the body. But then you go and you see thousands, and that's still only a fraction of how the truth has grown. And I guess what I'm really trying to say when I say that is there's a lack of appreciation for the battles, because the war is not over. The war is done when Christ returns, right? And the kingdom is returned to us. But wars are a series of battles. If you look up any type of history and you see any type of wars, the ones that weren't too long, right? Some is one battle and, is, and the war is one. It's a series of battles. And sometimes there's losses, and, but usually the one who wins, there's more wins than anything else. And you came into this moving machine where dominance by God had already been established where battles had already been won, where territory and ground had been gained, and you haven't seen it. So you came into something where there was government established and not here when it was just war. And there's a lack of appreciation for what we're fighting for because you've come into something where you can be on cruise control. You can blend in. You can be in the background. Not from God, but from everybody else. And then there's this sort of expectation of entitlement. Malachi did a class a while back about the entitlement mentality. I have some thoughts on that, but I said that was done too recently. I'm going to wait. That's in the list. It's in the topic list, right? Go a little more into that. But you have an entitlement mentality, brothers and sisters, of what your expectations are in this war. And you forgot the spirituality behind it of where God comes into play is how he places the pieces where he wants. All right? Now, let's get Revelation 7 and 1. Dealing with even in the kingdom, it's only a fraction that he needs for that to come about. Revelation 7 and 1. The book of Revelation, chapter 7 and verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. What are the four winds? Who can tell me what the four winds are? Colorado. Shalom, Deke. Uh, men? What scripture would you prove for that? Uh, second address, 12 and 5? 13 and 5. 13 Close. and 5. Fix your note in your Bible. <laughs> second address, 13. Hey, it's all right to have the note. It's a lot of scriptures. It's a lot of scriptures. Second Ezra, 13 and 5. The book of Second Ezra, chapter 13 and verse 5. And after this I beheld, and lo, there was gathered together a multitude of men, out of number. Meaning innumerable, come on. From the four winds of the heaven to subdue the man that came out of the sea. So it's not just any man. It's the man that came out of the sea is talking about Christ, all right? This is a parable. There's a metaphor, uh, a similitude of Christ. And it says this multitude of men is the armies of the earth, all right, of the kings and rulers of this present kingdom, all right? And when they see Christ and all the angels return, even in all the death and destruction and wailing of gnashing of teeth, they are still going to have it in them to fight back. You see this in their movies when they talk about, oh, they have hope. 
an alien invasion happens and they and they rise up to fight against it. They're dominated, but don't give up. Battle Los Angeles. Battle Los Angeles. And if you don't speak Spanish, it means the angels. Battle the angels. And what happened in that movie, if you ever saw it, I know it didn't do good in the in the in the in the movie theater, but they was getting their behind handed to them. And then somehow they find a way, right? Oh, there's a kink in their armor. And we see, but that's just their pomp, making them think that they can take the most high down, right? But it ain't gonna go down that way. You saw it in Independence Day, right? And they were down and out. Not even their nukes worked, but then they figured out a way, right? Uh battleship. That was another one with uh your girl Rihanna, right? And they figured out a way, right? They they always find a weakness, right? That's to comfort themselves. And it's also propaganda to set people to look, all people you're going to unite, all people are going to rise up against that, right? It's subtly that they show you that there's a threat from afar, and then they're going to try to come in together and be able to conquer it, right? Uh, we've gone over that on the show with Ronald Reagan and the Space Wars, right? He said, what if there was an enemy that would unite us all and we stop fighting against each other? So it's going into that, all right? Those armies that would rise up, and he's saying, listen, those four winds are being held back, right? Read verse 1 again. The book of Revelation, chapter 7 and verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Come on. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Right. So meaning they were in charge of when they would release these things. Right. So meaning they think that these other nations have their own will. But remember, you read in uh, Romans 9, it says he hardened Pharaoh's heart and he set him up only to be an example. Right. He's in control of all of that. You read in Job how in your sleep he programs them. That's not just us. He does that to all his creation. Now, what is the seal of the living God? What is the seal of the living God? Uh, Greg. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Joseph. You're good, you're good, you're good. Joseph, you, go come ahead. On, the, uh, Isaiah 8 and 16. Let's get it and read that. Come on. The book of Isaiah, chapter 8 and verse 16. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Right. Bind up the testimony. So now, break that down for me, Joseph. What is the testimony? And I didn't have that written down to ask that, but since mm -hmm. since the answer yeah. for the seal came up so quick, I'll make it harder. <laughs> that, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else who want to take a shot? What is the testimony? Nobody? All right. So what's the law? Can somebody at least give me that one, and then I'll give you the testimony. And I want the one in Revelation. Uh, give me Revelation 14, 12, and then there's another one. Uh, let me get it. Oh. It says the spirit of, of prophecy is Christ. I think that's what it is. Revelation? Yeah, that's it. That's it. You want 14 and 12 first? Give me 14 and 12 first. The book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Right, so they're sealed with the laws. Come on. And the faith of Jesus. And the, the testimony is the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That he's a black Messiah that came only for the Israelites, right? And he's going to give the kingdom of heaven on earth to us, to the Israelites only, all right? Let me get Revelation 19 and 10. Come on. The book of Revelation, chapter 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. He says he have the testimony of Jesus. Now, mind you, that was an angel, right, that he saw? You brothers that were up at the table, we spoke about that in Tobit, right, uh, about the angel, and he called him his brother. Right, y'all, those who don't know, it's all right. It's too much. You can't chew it, all right? That's for those who know, all right? Go ahead. That's why he said, I'm your brethren. Why is an angel telling him that? You brothers that were here that day know. Go ahead. Come on. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You want to get good at prophecy? You want to be able to understand those things? You cannot just preach the law. You must be able to preach 
the proper understanding of Christ, the proper testimony of Christ, and that will open up your understanding. All right? Let's go back now. Revelations uh, 7 and 2 again. The book of Revelation, chapter 7 and verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea. Hold on. Stop. So, the seal. There's something else I wanted to say about the seal. You have to understand something. It's not just us being sealed with the testimony and with uh, the laws. The Bible is not for all people to know. Even though it's written plainly and it's put out there, it's not for all people to know. Even amongst repenting Israel, some cannot receive its full breath. This goes back to what I was saying. Some of you don't realize what you're in. You're a casual believer and you don't know it. You've exchanged Christianity for this. You've exchanged church for this. And I'm not talking about just the ones that don't do anything and are on the side. Some of you that are even involved, your mind and your spirit is not in the right place. You move in a way that you want to maintain the state of this world. You don't see what at risk. And you are the ones that will have that spirit of Peter when he said, no, I won't deny you. And then when that day comes that you're tried, you will deny all of this to save your own skin. You will turn in. You will turn out whoever you need to to make it. And not because necessarily you might inherently be evil. You might be, remember, in every great house, there's vessels for honor and dishonor. Uh, but you didn't build yourself the way you needed to. You didn't get your mind in the right spirit. And only God will reveal that, right? It says every man in that day will know what his works are, right? None of us really can say confidently for sure. But we should move in a spirit of boldness, right? We'll talk about that later. So the Bible's not all, right? It's not, it's, the Bible's not for everybody to know. God has layers of understanding for us. Some of us have a ceiling in this walk, and there's nothing wrong with that. Remember the parable of the talents, right? He says, you'll be over this many cities, you'll be over that many cities. So it might not even be that you're fuel for the fire. You might be a precious stone, but you're only going to, right? It, they, they, you're only going to grow but so much, right? You know, you ever seen the little palm trees, the little short ones, right? They ain't going to be like the tall ones, right? They're just going to be the little, right? They got the little, I don't know what they call them, pygmy palm trees or whatever they call them. Be into that stuff, right? They like they like dwarf ones, right? It's still a palm tree. It's just never gonna be the one that grows above the fence line, and that's okay. You know, they still have a purpose and a use, whatever it is. Okay, but some are going to be great tall trees. Some are gonna be bushes. There's still honor in that, right? That's just the way it is. There's layers to it. I want you to understand that. Let's get Romans eleven and eight. Romans 11 and 8. The book of Romans, chapter 11 and verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. Meaning, that's why I said what I said. The Bible, even amongst repenting Israelites, some of you, and, and that's right, because if you're repenting, that means you got some understanding, but some things your eyes are closed to it. Some things he's not going to open up. You understand? That's the ceiling that I'm talking about. It says, even unto this day, some cannot grasp the full breadth of what we're in and what the scriptures say. Gosh, damn, I forgot to put it in. There's another scripture in Revelations. I was trying to look for it. I can't remember exactly where it is. Where it talks about, like, uh, I'm paraphrasing it, like, uh, uh, like they were the only ones able to receive it. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if it deals with the ones that are not defiled by women. <sighs> See, that's what I'm saying. This is a version of a class. Another version may come out of it, all right, on the same topic. Let me go uh, to Isaiah 29 and 11. Don't worry about looking at the one in Revelation. It just popped in my head now. When I was rewriting my notes, I was supposed to add it, and I didn't. The book of Isaiah, chapter 29 and verse 11. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Right, so the Bible is a book that is sealed. So that's why I say it's not for all to know. And we just read in Romans 11 that even unto this day, who is God talking to uh, through this in, 
to Paul in Romans 11. Israelites. Israelites. I know a lot of times we use that and we talk about Christianity, and it's true. But remember, the book is directed to us primarily. So there, it, there's, there's multiple applications of these scriptures and how we use them. Paul's talking to the Israelites, the diaspora in Rome. And he's telling you, even unto this day, some of you still can't get it. God has put the spirit of deep sleep upon you. Now, there's things that you can do for God to open that up in you, but you won't do it. Right? You won't humble yourself before the hand of the Most High. You won't apply Proverbs 3 and 5, trusting in him with all your heart. You still, where's the spirituality and how things move and how you, how you expect them to be? Read Isaiah 29 again. The book of Isaiah, chapter 29 and verse 11. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book. The vision of all. You, the beginning, end, and midst of times is in this book. Come on. That is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned. Meaning, you go to somebody that knows their Israel, that knows that they got to wear fringes, keep the Sabbath and everything else. Come on. And they'll say what? Same. Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Because it has not been opened up to you in the way that it is for others. And that's okay. Because it says, he who has small understanding, right, but is able to apply these scriptures, has strong faith, will be greater than somebody that does. I don't want to misconstrue this to say that it's all about knowledge, because people can fake knowledge, right? You can have the precepticons, right? That they can just drop, oh, I know scripture after scripture after scripture, right? But by actions are we weighed. And that's what God looks at. And that's what God sees. Yeah, does it help if you're a good speaker and you're able to pull those things? Sure, but that's not everybody's gift. What means more to him is that you're on fire for this truth because he don't want lukewarm. He'd rather you stand on one side or the other, right? And that you are fervent about applying and trying to increase. A lot of times we hear about increasing wisdom and what do people think, especially brothers most of the time? Prophecy. Prophecy. And not all are prophets in that way. Not all have that spirit for prophecy. Will prophecy get you salvation without application and deep understanding of the deep basics and the law? No. Is it exciting that things that are sealed can be uh, revealed to you? Sure. Just like it's exciting when you get a gift that's wrapped and you don't know what's in it. But then you see it, and now what? It might not be something that profits you. Somebody gets you a, a uh, I don't know, I don't want to say something, and people think I'm giving it indirect. Somebody gets you a knife, and you don't know how to cook for the life of you. I'm talking about like a cooking knife or something like that, right? You know? Somebody gets you like a, uh, a lotion with lavender, and you're allergic to lavender. Oh, oh, I know what's in it, but how does that help me now? Right? Nothing. I got to be careful because people get in their feelings. I'm like, damn, did I get them that and you didn't like it? No. All right, I'm just throwing something out there. So learned repenting might have some skill, but their heart and their head is not right. Right? Uh, I'll give you an example. I was watching uh, Snake Eyes, the G.I. Joe thing, right? And there's a scene where he's trying to get into this clan. Right, and they have all these things of honor, and he goes through these three trials, right? Goes through these three trials. And the third trial, uh, if he doesn't pass it, he dies. And I'm probably going to spoil the movie for you, but it wasn't that good so far anyway. I didn't even finish it. But I still see stuff spiritual in everything that I'm watching anyway. He goes down into this pit, and it's these ancient giant anacondas, right? And they say... The third test is, if your heart is pure, the snakes won't kill you. And I saw so much deepness in that. Remember, you know, we're, 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 set, um, we're set out amongst a sheep among wolves, right? You know, there's vipers and snakes all around us. And up until that point, he was able to pass the first two trials because he was skillful. He could fight. He understood certain aspects of humility even, right? There's another scene where... He has to hold a bowl of water, and, and the other teacher's holding a bowl of water. And he tells him, I need you to take my bowl, and I'm going to take your bowl. And he says, uh, yeah, you don't have to put that, though. I don't want to, because I'm going to go too long, and, and we want to feast. 
and he says, uh, and he says, but the, the key is you can't spill any water. And he says, you get four chances. After the fourth chance, you're done. And so the dude starts fighting him to get the water. And on his third chance, he only had one chance left, he starts thinking of some lessons that his friend had told him. And I'm looking at this as scripture, and this goes where I say it's not just where I say some people may have some skill. They might even be able to learn some humility, but they can't progress because ultimately I'm going to go back to the part with the anacondas. He realized that he never thought to try to exchange the bowl with the guy. He went to fight him right away. Right? So he stops and he talks to himself. He remembers some lessons he got, and he says, you know, master, whatever, he says, uh, I would like to offer you my bowl in exchange for yours. And that ended the test. And meanwhile, he was fighting, right, the whole time trying to fight, which is an impossible thing to, how are you going to fight, which is contact, and not spill the water? So then he gets to that third test. That's what I'm saying. He had some skill, but his heart was not pure. So the snakes was about to kill him. I'm not going to tell you what happened, so you can still, if you want to watch it. And the snakes was about to kill him, right? And uh, because his heart wasn't pure. So some of y'all, you know, you'll get to a certain point. Remember I said you'll have that ceiling. But you are not right, and you can't let yourself get right. So you don't let God work his perfect work. You don't let him establish and settle you. And you're not able to progress because your heart's not pure. Let's get Psalms 111 and 10. If I would have started earlier, I would have let you play videos and all that stuff, but I can't. Good job, though. Y'all were fast with that. They wanted to show the clips. Psalms 111 and 10. The book of Psalms, chapter 111 and verse 10. Now, don't go. It's, it's really not that. It's okay. It's good fighting. People are going to go watch it. That's me. I see something spiritual and everything. You're going to go watch the movie and try to see something spiritual racking your brain, and you won't even enjoy it for what it is. It's a popcorn flick, right? There's just a lot of fighting. Psalm 111 and 10. And not even real fighting. It's like the type where you don't get touched. Psalm 111 and 10. The book of Psalms, chapter 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Right. That do, that do, that do his commandments. Some of you aren't right. You're in secret sin. You have grudges. You have roots of bitterness. Some of you are not fixing your marriages in earnest. So your growth has stopped. You think you're okay, but you're not. And I can, I said, man, if I keep doing a list, I'm going to have a page of all the things that people deal with. Some of you are not right in that way. It says his praise endureth forever. It don't mean you do it once and that's it. It's a continual thing. And you, he wants to open up more to you. He wants to give you more understanding. He wants to activate more gifts in you. I think I was supposed to put a note about that too and I didn't. I was going to go into talking about leaders and not everybody's leaders, not everybody has a certain skill set. because e and, and I used to think that anybody can be cultivated into something. But now, as I've grown in this truth and what I understand in the scriptures, in Jeremiah, where he says, before I formed ye, I foreknew you. He sold you with everything that he was going to have you for this lifetime before he put you in that womb. The Bible magnifies and brings that out if you let it. Some of you are the square peg, and you'll never be the round peg. You know what I'm talking about with the shapes and you put the shapes in the hole, right? But you don't do enough of the self-examination, of the proper cultivating to see where you fit. And there's no amount of, right, because the world teaches you could be whatever you want to be. Even if you're a man, you could be a woman, right, to that extreme, right, or vice versa. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? If all were the eye, where were the hearing, right? If all were the ear, where were the seeing? That's fine. But, uh, again, I, I, I forgot to put it in, and it was because I'm trying to condense the class. But you have to understand that whatever you were meant to be for God's purpose, he put it in your soul before he put you in the womb. And he's waiting to activate whatever extent. And to some, it's one gift. To others, very rarely, it's several. Right? He has some that they're meant to be exceptional for him. 
not for praise and glory and vanity of yourself, but exceptional for him and his purpose. But everybody has something, even if it's just to be made manifest that you were not part of this, which is scary, right? That should keep that fear in you to move in the right spirit. Read Psalm 111 and 10 again. The book of Psalms, chapter 111 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do is commanded. And the point that I want to reemphasize in this is that this goes to show what I was saying about having some skill and having some levels. And this is why I say even amongst repenting Israel, there's a ceiling and there's layers of understanding. Because your fear is enough to get you through the door. You'll be in that mixed multitude. But if you want a good understanding, if you really want to see if you're ready for this battle and to endure for what's to come, you have to continue to get these things out of your system. You cannot be in the wrong spirit and not have a pure heart, meaning your mind. And it's interesting, that clip in Snake Eyes, when he says he don't have a pure heart, they know that too. They weren't talking about his organ that beats blood. He confessed after, hey, I'm jacked up. All I have is revenge in my head. He had a root of bitterness. He says, I want to get the guy that killed my father years ago. He says, and that's all that drives me. And I'll do anything to get that at whatever cost. If it means betraying somebody, then I'll do it. He didn't say it in those exact words, but that's the gist of the movie if you've seen it. Right? So when it says his heart wasn't pure, it's going into the mind. And they understand that even. Because there's things that you hold on inside of you that you refuse to resolve. And let it go don't mean brush it under the rug. And then it comes up outside of the rug, around it. Somebody moves the rug and it's there. The skeleton's in your closet. It means you get rid of it. You purge it out, you obliterate it. You turn it to ashes so that that's not in you anymore. Let's go back to Romans 11. What time is it? Romans 11 and 8. The book of Romans, chapter 11 and verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. Come on. Unto this day. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Right. He's saying the table is this Bible. So he's telling you that this own Bible to those whose heart ain't right, whose mind ain't right, whose spirit isn't right. He says this Bible will become a stumbling block to you. Read on. Verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened. And he says, because it's a stumbling block to you. Now you're not going to be able to have this full breadth of understanding come out to you. Come on. That they may not see and bow down their back always. And you will always be that way. And your eyes will always be darkened by the Lord. You might have the fear. Don't mean you're totally out. I mean, ultimately, that's what he's talking about. But letting you know that there's levels to it. So it says that it could become a stumbling block. How? How? How can this Bible... And you're repenting, you know, I'm keeping dietary, I'm wearing fringes, I'm keeping the Sabbath. How can it become a stumbling block? Uh, Ashaya. Um, I'm trying to think of the scripture. I just got an answer, but not a scripture. <laughs> well, I want both, but let yeah, me hear what you got. Right. Um, as, a train, as a train moves on, the train is moving at a thousand miles per hour. You are uh, still at five miles per hour, ten miles an hour. You're stagnant. You're deflecting, which is deceptive. Um, now, scripture, I don't have one off the bat. I didn't process that. <laughs> right okay. Away. Well, I like the analogy. It doesn't really take it all the way home. Anybody else want to give a shot before I move on? Sam. Test. The scripture that says uh, forever learner, but not ever. So I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, that. yeah, but that still don't. Okay. All right. I'm going to give it to you for the sake of time. And it, bear with me as I explain it. Ecclesiastes 7, and let me get 16. Because what I want you to know is how it comes about. The stuff that you're saying is kind of. The after. But before you get to that point, uh, there's ways that you can identify it. Come on. 
the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7 and verse 16. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Right, so there's a lot of confusion when it comes to this scripture, right? You say, oh, you're being overrighteous, you're being overrighteous. I'm going to explain what that means when that is being said, all right? So it says, be not righteous over much, right? Neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy of thyself? Well, very simply, actually, before I give you the answer, who wants to explain those verses? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that? Go ahead, Ashai. All right, I'm trying to find the scripture real quick. Um... To sum it up, I can't find the, this, the precept. But it's, try to explain the verse to me. It goes into correction, where you, where you um, can't take correction. No one can tell you about yourself, so you can better yourself. Oh yeah, that's basic though. That's part of it. You're not wrong. Go ahead, uh, Officer Isaac. Are those prescription, or are you just styling? Yeah. Okay. You know, clothing and stuff has spirits on it, right? Yes, sir. Uh, just saying, like if they're not uh, prescription, it, you know. It's definitely prescription. I know a lot of brothers that have gotten they, trouble. They reading glasses. When they step their glasses game up, they just they put some sort of spirit on them. You know, brothers do the shades. Yeah, it's prescription. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. It's going into uh, focusing it on things that's not pertaining to your salvation, like the uh, the, the thing he quoted, ever learning. But not um, ever learning, but never coming to the truth. No. Or, okay, right. understood. Jump to verse twenty. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you what it means. Oh, Tobias got it. No, but now I said verse twenty. So now I was jump go to, to verse I twenty. I was gonna go to something else, but no. you could go a lot of places. But I'm trying to get to the point. Yes, sir. Go to verse twenty, same chapter. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter seven and verse twenty. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Some of y'all put yourself in the frame of mind that you're on point, and you stop checking yourself. Some of you are so focused on wanting to point out other people's faults. And that's not the same as Leviticus 5 and 1, right? See something, say something, right? That's different. Something falls in your lap, and you know it's sin, you do it. That's not even your position. That's for the judges, to do that. You know, there's another scripture that says, don't rest judgment. That's not for you to sit there and try to find fault in people. Now, if the fault is evident, then sure, you got to say something. But some of you think you're so on point. This is what it means to be overrighteous, that you forgot to look at yourself. Your fly's undone. You got a booger hanging out your nose. You didn't pluck that chin hair, sister. You missed one. You understand what I'm saying? So you're so confident that you're right that you forgot verse 20. Read it again. The book of That's why it says don't be overwise because then you're going to destroy yourself. Come on. Chapter 7 and verse 20. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That includes you, overrighteous. That includes you, overwise. That your first thing is to point at others. If something is happening to you, is to point at others. And you forgot that there's no man that sin if not. Let's get that in 1 Kings 8 and 46. The Bible is repetitive for a reason. And your answers were not wrong, brothers. It's just that could be a class by itself if we got that granular. I just wanted the simple overview to keep this not so complicated for people. When somebody says you're being overrighteous, it's because you're trying to go to extreme, right? It goes into like straining at a gnat, but then the weight of your matters and stuff. It don't mean that sin is okay, right? It don't mean that, oh, you shouldn't keep this law or that law. You just forgot that everybody has their own battle to fight. And something that might have been a swat of the hand and you were able to demolish it for you 
is the elephant in the room for somebody else. And as long as they're fighting, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not for you to be the one to sit. That's when Christ says take the beam out of your eye, right? Before you try to take the moat from somebody else. That's the essence of what it's really going into, right? Outside of the scope of what I want to discuss right now, I just want you to focus on this aspect of it. Come on, go ahead. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 8, verse 46. And I only want the first part of that. Go ahead. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not. Oh, well, look at that. David said that, and uh, Solomon, his son, said it here in Ecclesiastes. Where do you think he got that from? There is no man that sinneth not. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Let's go to 1 John 1 and 8. It's in here a little, there a little. It's all over the scriptures. But we make ourselves overwise. You can remember a bunch of precepts. You watch a lot of classes. You study a lot. But you forgot the weightier matters. Mercy, faith, judgment. And it starts with you first. Because if judgment starts at the house of God first, and the righteous will scarcely be saved, then what type of spirit should you be in, the scriptures tell you? Focusing on everybody else or continually working on yourself? And I'm going to show you why that's important. Go ahead, read this. The book of 1 John, chapter 1 and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There you go in that deception. There you go thinking that you're all right. Uh, Paul was saying it in Romans 11. Till this day, you're blinded. Because you think that you have to plainly say that I have no sin in order for that to be true. But what happened is, is you're so focused on somebody else that you forgot to look at the dirt in your house. Right? You forgot to check those things out. Let me get Galatians 6 and 1. It's another one that's misapplied. Everybody gets all touchy-feely christian -y about this. I'm going to drag that brother or sister to the finish line. No. They need to feel shame for their sin. Because that's where godly sorrow comes forth. That will then bring forth fruit, meat for repent. You want to be pitiful upon everybody when they're in the midst of something. No, I'm going to curse you out. I'm going to make you feel like crap for what you did until you've overcome it. How are you going to let me overcome it if you, don't, if you keep calling it? Have you overcome it? No. So I'm going to keep calling it. You a liar? You're a liar. I will call you a liar till you're a liar no more. You're a thief, you're a thief. I will call you a thief till you're a thief no more. Because I got to remind you. Because you'll think that if everything's chummy and everything's good, that everybody else forgot. So how it goes down. Right. You porn brothers. Every, every chance I get, I'm on y'all. Because I want you to feel shameful about it so that you can stop doing it. Don't worry. Don't get nervous. Somebody's looking at me like I'm going to say your name. I'm not going to embarrass you in front of the sisters. I might embarrass you later in front of some of the brothers, though. Go ahead. The book of Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 1. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Come on. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I'm not going to deal with the first part of that. But being over-righteous is you forgot the last part in that verse. Read that part again. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. This is what I mean when, when I says you stand there in such boldness, like you think you're on point, you say you have no sin, and you're over here thinking, oh, you know, oh, this happened because of that, and this one like that. And it's not even your place to give your opinion on the judgment. I did a class on Monday Night Law about that, I think. I don't think we were recording Monday Night Laws. I might revisit it and expound upon it, but about judgment. We have it up about judgment. And I went into speaking about resting judgment, right? We forget the consideration of ourselves. You think you have no sin. You think you have no fault. So how can you restore somebody else in the spirit of meekness when you haven't considered yourself? Your heart ain't right. You're not moving in the right spirit. Let's get John 8 and 1. We're going to read 1 through 11. Christ gave it the best way, the best example. 
The book of St. John, chapter 8 and verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. I mean, we saw her. We walked in and caught her. Come on. Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now he writes on the ground twice in this, right? And I know a lot of times people are like, what did he write? What did he write? There's nothing definitive. We've been told that he was writing their sins, right? There's nothing we can say. to. That's kind of what most of us in leadership go with, right? Um, you know, he does it twice. So I'm thinking maybe he started writing laws of sins. That, you know how, like, we'll be in a class and we'll talk about a sin and some of you are like, damn, does he know I did that? And I don't know a damn thing. I don't know what the hell you did. I ain't, you know, I ain't like that. I can't imagine having sight like that, dealing with that, that level of stuff, right? You know, so I, li I, I like to think he started writing laws, right? right? Maybe about bitterness, maybe some of them in the midst of adultery, maybe, right? Go ahead, come on. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you. Let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So for me, I envisioned this, that first he wrote some laws, and then he started writing names next to those. You know how I said, I'm not going to accept your name to embarrass you, porno brothers? He actually wrote the name down, right? Go ahead. Verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. This is the consider yourself. This is the over-righteous. They were ready to put that sister to death, and they did not consider how easy it is for each of us to fall into sin because we're in Ecclesiastes 7 and 20. And you become over-wise because you swear you got all the precepts for everything. Listen, you could have the best gun collection in your house, but don't know how to handle the kick, the recoil, how to, do the, how to sight your weapon in what applications, what weapon is more appropriate and not. See how more nuanced it is? I've said this before, knowledge is not power. Knowledge applied is power. And some of you have so much knowledge, you don't have an appreciation for the power that it is and how to control it, how to wield it properly, how to move in the right spirit. And it starts with yourself, because you get yourself hurt. And that's what was going to happen in this situation. Go ahead. Come on. Read on. Verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus, Damn, Not a one of them. Not a one of them could stand there and say that they could condemn that sister. Not a one. Showing you the proof of what we read in Kings and what we read in 1 John. In what we read in uh, Ecclesiastes 7 and 20. Okay, come on. Verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Right. And that's to consider yourself to know that, right? Okay, you can be forgiven of those things, but don't do them anymore. Put that stuff away from you, all right? Put that stuff away from you. Let's get 1 Peter 5 and 8. And I haven't changed the subject. I'm taking a long way around, but 1 Peter 5 and 8. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Right, so this basically summarizes why Remember, we start in Ecclesiastes 7, 16, about uh, don't be overwise. It says you'll destroy thyself. Don't be overrighteous. Because uh, Galatians 6, talking about consider thyself, understanding that there's no man that sinneth not. Not a one of us is just in the earth. It says you have to understand and be, so this is why you have to always be sober. And that sobriety 
has so much that goes into that. It's but having that pure heart, right? Be sober, be vigilant. Read on. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. Wait, is wait, wait, but wait. I thought be vigilant was I got to be vigilant looking out for everybody else's issues. He didn't say their adversary. Be vigilant because their adversary, the devil. He said he's your adversary. He's your adversary. He's your adversary. He's my adversary. So we all must be sober. We all must be vigilant. Come on. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And you ever watch those nature shows? You see the lions as they creep, as they creep, right? And they, and they start spotting from deep who's the weak link. And they say, all right, yeah, you know, this one right here, all right. Okay, but I'm going to wait. And they'll wait patient. They'll inch up. They'll wait patient. Because you think it's going to happen all at once. And it don't happen that way sometimes. Again, this is why, and, and then there you are, not being sober, not being vigilant, thinking you got this, and then realize you, you got the biggest scarlet letter, the most egg on your face. Maybe nobody else saw it, right? Because the rest of those wildebeest that he's hunting didn't know who was going to be the weak link. It's not until the attack happens that they, oh, snap, shorty's getting killed, right? Just like that, that's Satan. Because you're the little one, right? The little one he goes for at the end of the thing, right? Just like that, creeping, Satan, your adversary. And here you are being over-righteous, over-wise, thinking you all good, worrying about other people's issues, other people's problems. You know, and it doesn't surprise me because by our nature we like that. I remember growing up in the projects, right? You're looking out, you hear something, you look out the window, you're like, ooh, it's about to go. you all in everybody's business. Oh, yeah, I saw, I saw Doña Olga smack up Tito the other day. I saw this one's husband coming in with that one. Oh, yeah, you didn't see this over here? You know, coming in at this time. I saw him with the bottle. I saw him smoking the cigarette. I saw him smoking the spliff, whatever it is. We like that. We like drama. We like gossip, right? We're drawn to that sort of stuff. Remember, there's laws written on that type of stuff about not being busybodies and other men's business, murmuring and all. There's a reason for it. There's a reason we had to be told that because it's in us to be that way. So part of being sober and being vigilant is realizing that we all have the potential to be that way. Even in your righteousness, nose up type of mentality that we might be tend to have. This is why I say we don't realize if we're ready for the battle or not. The Most High is going to use those people, not that they're perfect. Remember, there's no man that don't deal with something, right? But that they're able to identify these things and say, oh, ha ha, I see you, Satan, over there. You think you're blending into the tall grass right there, so I'm going to take action on this. And usually, what's the action in the wilderness? I'm going to get closer into the bunch because if he sees us together, he knows he can't single me out and try to jump at me and take me down. Right? That's usually the protection, right? If they make it into the herd, they're good. If they lag behind the herd, it's a wrap, right? So we must be mindful of that. Jump to Job 1 and 7. We're going to come back to 1 Peter 5. In case you forgot Satan's job. The book of Job, chapter 1 and verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan. So his purpose is to be lurking around. Remember, said he walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. In Job, he just tells you that he's going in and out, right? When you get to Peter, he says he walks about to see whom he may devour. This is what Satan was made for by the Most High God. It's not God's equal. It's not a fallen angel. He's not God's adversary. It says he's your adversary. God made an adversary for us. But there's a reason behind all of that. Go back to 1 Peter 5. Read 8 and 9. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom, you, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. That goes, goes into that Galatians 6 and 1. Consider thyself, right, if a brother be overtaken in a fault. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, right? 
meaning all of us go through those things. Nothing has come to us except such that is common to man, all right? But it says that you must consider yourself and resist, resist, resist steadfast, meaning you hold. Come on, read. Verse 10, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And he says, after you've suffered a while, he'll make you perfect, establish you, strengthen, and settle you. How does he make us perfect and settle us? Let's get Sirach 2 and 5. The book of Sirach, chapter 2 and verse 5. For gold is tried in the fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. Right. So a lot of times y'all think, damn, I can't find an apartment. I'm going through trials. Damn, I lost my job. I'm going through trials. I can't pay my car note. I'm going through trials. That's called life, brothers and sisters. That's called life, and that's the way Esau has set it up, the haves and have-nots. That's not a trial. There's three trials we deal with. Congregational, yourself, and your marriage. That's it. And within those, you would expand upon them, just like the ten, right, or a summation of all the laws. Within those three, that's it. The stuff you're dealing with at your job, and that's not a trial. That's called life when you're not in rulership. You have to realize the trials that you deal with. Read that verse again. The book of Sirach, chapter 2 and verse 5. For gold is tried in the fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. Believe in him, and he will help thee. I'm Jump to verse 1. I'm sorry. Verse 1. My son, if thou, if thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. That's don't be over-righteous. Don't be over-wise. Be sober. Be vigilant. So a lot of times we hear that, prepare yourself for temptation. What does that mean? Everything that we've just brought out. Come on. Verse 2, set thy heart aright. There we go again, talking about your heart, your mind. It says you got to set it aright. Come on. And constantly endure. And stand steadfast. Resist steadfast. Come on. And make not haste in time of trouble. And when the time of trouble, meaning that you stand on these scriptures, you don't make haste when things happen. Come on. Cleave unto him. And depart not away, that thou mayest be increased at thy last end. Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully, and be patient when thou art changed to a low estate. Read on. For gold is tried in the fire. And he's saying, and all those things is your trying. This is how he's trying to, remember it says, after you've suffered for a while, he'll establish you and settle you. Come on. For gold is tried in the fire, and acceptable men. And acceptable men, acceptable men. The men that are going to go to war. You got to go through these things and show yourself fit in how you move and how you operate in these situations. That's what's going to make it be known whether you're of the battle or you're not. If you're ready for it or not. And that's if some of y'all even care. Some of y'all have opportunity wide open to be built up and learn. To be prepared to be fit for the Lord's army. And you don't even want to do it. And that's fine. That's fine if you do it because you say, okay, man, that's not for me. Maybe I'm not for that. Some of you are just bitter and you're mad and you sour. You go on, be like that. There's just too much to go on. There's too much that's being discussed of always pushing this thing further to new levels, to make provisions for the people. Nobody cares about your boo-hoo BS. They don't. And if you want somebody to care about your boo-hoo BS, there's plenty of Christian churches that you can go to or go back to if that's what you came out of. The door is there. We focus in on the trees that have good fruit. The ones that don't put forth fruit, Christ said they're good for nothing than to be hewn and tossed to the fire. Don't mean by us, but that's what's in store for you. Just like the scripture says in every great house, Vessels for honor, vessels for dishonor. Ones that'll be eat up by the fire, ones that'll be purified by it. Uh, What verse did we leave at? I want to go to verse 7. The end of 5. Okay, okay, read on. And acceptable men in the furnace of adversity, believe in him, and he will help thee. Let's get 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Uh. 
The book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is why you must remember and realize what we read in Ecclesiastes 7 and 20, that there is no man that sinneth not. Why you must consider yourself. Why you should not be over-righteous and over-wise in your own conceit. Because we all, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ alone. There ain't nothing you, oh, but Lord, I pointed out so much fault in other people. What did you do for you? Is what he's going to ask. Come on. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Right, because your body's going to change, right? We're going to change in the inkling of, of, an, of a twinkling of an eye, right? It says, but the things you did in your body, in the carnalness that he gave you, in the temple that he gave you to reside in, in this present life, he says, you will all must receive for the things done in his body. Come on. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So you're going to get merits and you're going to get demerits in that judgment seat. You know, Jehovah Witness, they used to give out the little comic book and it'll, it'll show you sitting and they show you the movie of your life. Everybody ever got one of those? Some of you probably used to give those out. You know which one I'm talking about? All right? Elkanah, oh, you were Jehovah? The Lord Jehovah. All right? They give that the little comic book and they show the guy and he gets there and he sits down and they show a screen and he sees his whole life. And it's like real petty stuff. It's not like anything significant about the laws and the degree of it or whatever. But it's kind of like that. And you're going to see the story of your life in front of you. Good and bad, what you did. And you all must hold account for that by yourself. That's why it says, uh, seek your own salvation with fear and trembling. Right? Again, and like I said, the overrighteous could probably be a class all by itself. There's more levels. But at its core, it's talking about those people that think they okay. And they're so quick to want to point out stuff in others, and they don't realize what they got going on within themselves. And I think that's endemic in Israel. I see it all the time. Even in the midst of you trying to deal with somebody in correction, it, like is somebody coming to you maybe to correct you on something that they saw, not that they searched for, right? Something that was evident, they caught you in the midst of something, you'll start trying to like now talk about their faults. You know where that happens the most? In a marriage. Right? The hus usually the husband starts talking to the wife about things he wanted to fix, and now she now she didn't say nothing to you about none of your stuff until you bring it up to her to talk about her stuff. No, 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 no. That's not the time. No, now we're talking about you. It's your time. You sitting in this seat right now. Right? You sitting in this seat right now. He's trying to flip this thing around like that. Yeah, you laughing. That's what's waiting for you. It's waiting for you, single brothers. That's what's waiting for you. All right. Let's get back to Ecclesiastes 7.16. I'm probably going to try to cut this short so I don't keep your. I'm going to miss the essence of what I wanted to bring out if I do that. But The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7 and verse 16. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Right, so you think you have it all figured out, and then you focus on looking out at others, right? So much that you forget where you lack, and you fail to fix it. Let's get, uh, I'm going to skip that one. Let's go back to Revelation 7 and 1. Revelation 7 and 1. The book of Revelation, chapter 7. And verse 1, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all tribes of the children of so Israel. So notice it says the number of them which were sealed. Remember, we started all the way back in the beginning with numbers, talking about the number of them. We went to Exodus to see the number of them, right? And now you get to the end, and he says the number of them which was sealed, right? Come on. Verse 5, of the tribe of Judah, 
there were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben, were sealed 12,000. The tribe of Gad, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephtali, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin, were sealed 12,000. And these were men. These were men. Let's get Revelation 21 and 3. We already read Ezekiel 34, 31. The book of Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Men, men, he will dwell with them, he will dwell with men. Go ahead, finish up. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will be our God. So this is men, and they're all men, for rulership and war. For rulership and war. Because those 12,000 got work to do from each tribe. Okay, you want to show some of those pictures? You know that AI art is crazy, right? It's the mindset we got to have for this stuff. What do you think them 12,000 going to be soft, manby, pamby, yellow makes me sad? You think, you, you think you're a warrior, but you're not? Everybody got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. People talk strong until they get, right? That's why you see fights and people, damn, why did they freeze and they didn't hit back? Because they never been punched in the mouth before. Mm. They didn't know what it felt like, so they didn't know how to react. So many can talk so bold and strong. Got it. What else you got? I know you were showing more men of war. Yeah, you can show them up as I'm, as I'm still going through it for the sake of time, all right? So these were men of war. So even in the beginning, when we came out of Egypt, what happened when we came out of Egypt? We forgot all the laws and the customs, right? So the re-giving of the law was done to us. And then what happened? In our repentance, we then went to war. In the end, he's going to have a number. That's for war. And guess what is symbolic and what we do now? Each of us, when we come out of this world, spiritually Egypt, spiritually Sodom, we repent. And then what needs to happen? War. War. Not a physical war, but war nonetheless. All right? Read verse 9. I'm going to try to skip through some of this. The book of Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues. No, uh, Revelation 7 and 9? Oh, 7 and 9. Sorry. Sorry about that. The book of Revelation, chapter 7 and verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Give me some quick scriptures for people that say... It says all nations. Anybody? James 1 and 1. What else? Uh-huh. What else? Uh-huh. What else? 2 and 42. Yep. Anything else? You can do Amos 9 and 9. You can do Matthew 19, 27 and 28. All right. We're not going to read them for the sake of time. Genesis 32, 9 and 12. Genesis 48 and 19. All right. So all, and all of those go through various things about we would be a multitude of nations, all that stuff like that. All right. Go ahead. Finish that verse. Uh, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and no. about the elders. No, nope, that was it. Um, the white robes is going into not clothing, but not being in. Remember how it said in the judgment seat what you did in your body? You Okay. Your spiritual body. Remember, uh, I can't remember exactly where, where uh, in the New Testament talks about uh, there's terrestrial and celestial, right? Letting you know that there's a difference, right? There's some other precepts for it, but again, that's not for now. All right, I'm going to try to, man, I really want to get every scripture. In. I'm going to try to jump to it because I want to get to my essence of this. Uh, let's get, let's get Ephesians 6 and 10. Ephesians 6 and 10. Try to see where I can jump to consolidate this. 
it's all right. Sometimes this happens, and then I get to do it, like, maybe for a Sabbath class, and then I can expand on it. Like I said, the, the show I've been wanting to move into some of the stuff about building the brothers up. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Ephesians 6, to start at 10, we're going to read all the way to 20. So you can read 10 through 12. You can read it kind of quick. The book of Ephesians, chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why? Come on. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Right, you resist, hold steadfast, all right? We must put on the whole armor, come on. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The point is, I wanted to build to it a little more to give you more examples. This walk is about war. And even if you're not going to be the soldier in the war, you have to understand that in your support capacity, it's about war. When you go back to Numbers 31, if you read all the way down to verse 9, it says that when they won the Israelites, they took the women and the children of the Midianites captive. Meaning that that's what warfare is like. So sisters, you might not see yourself and even maybe fully, because women are built different. Maybe you can understand the mission to a point, but you're not going to feel the war like we do. But understand that if we if we're not gonna lose the war, we understand that it's a fixed fight. But if we lose battle, it's not just the men that get jacked up. The women and the children are spoils of war. So you got skin in the game, sisters, even if you're not feet boots on the ground like the men are. Y'all at risk of not having a hedge over you. That's that's the result of, of losing the battle. The women and the children, and you know how the heathen going to roll when it comes to the women and children. And just look at it physically, you know, but let's just look at it spiritually. Look at the condition of our people to this day because of them having to rule over us. The strong, independent black woman, what has that done for our people? What has that done to our children? All you got to do is just go on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. That's not Israel focused. And just look in general of what's out there. Turn on the TV, look at the news, look at the rappers, look at the celebrities. You see the results of, of those battles we've lost. So it's time for us to gain that back. It's war that we're a part of. And that spiritual wickedness in high places, that's the Jewish establishment. That's the Sodom agenda. That's the Willie Lynch, the deconstruction of our people to keep us apart. Scripture says, from whence come wars? from fightings amongst ourselves. It's high time that that stuff stops and we all get our mind in the right mindset, whether you're going to be a support position or you're going to be out there on the front lines. But all of it is needful and all of it is necessary for the battle. And be man enough, if you're not man enough to be in the war, to say, okay, I'm all right with that mixed multitude. Let me support in whatever way I can. And stop giving grief. Come on, read. Verse 13, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Armor is for warfare. Armor is for warfare and nothing else. Come on. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see how many layers there is to be fully armored in this? Not everybody's going to be able to. And guess what? You can't be on the front lines if you don't have the whole arm of God on you. Come on, read. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And don't forget that the war so much that you forget the faith, the supplication, praying in the Spirit. Some brothers get so focused on the battle, they forget the other matters. Come on. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. Boldly. Once we get ourselves set up, once our righteousness has been fulfilled, once our obedience has been fulfilled, then we can go out and do that stuff. Get ourselves right and built up. And it says you go out boldly, that we may open our mouth boldly. And when he says, may utterance may given unto me, that you pray that the Spirit of the Most High rest upon you so that you know what to say in that hour and that time. Come on. 
to make known the mystery of the gospel. Come on. For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And we need men, men, men with this spirit. Men with this spirit. Let's get Acts 17 and 6. The book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. We need men that got the spirit to turn things upside down. Some of you are not that. You cannot be the brother to build another brother up, and you don't got the spirit to thir- turn things upside down. To be bold, to speak boldly, to be an ambassador in bonds. That this is your purpose, that this is your life. So I said, so many of you want to maintain the state of this world and how you move and operate. And you think that that's going to be enough. You know what? Don't worry. Just don't get in the way. Stay out the damn way. And let the men that are going to be about this, that have the spirit to turn things upside down. Some of you want to go out, oh, I want to preach, I want to teach. You ain't got the spirit to turn things upside down. And it don't mean that you're screaming and shouting in the street. These people are going to have passion and fire for their people. Not just to try to show out. We talk about brothers that teach even amongst the captainship sometimes and they and they're dry and, and they, the word should excite you your heart should be on fire for this some of you in mov all oh, yellow makes me sad i had a bad day i didn't get a raise my boss wrote me up or he yelled at me somebody flipped me off on the highway focus all that be in bond so that you can be an ambassador for the Most High in Christ and have the spirit to turn things upside down. Let's get Hebrews 13 and 7. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 7. Let me tell you, I, like I said, we talk about things. You're going to see, you see the evidence of those things as we roll them out, as we make those changes. We're not just all there, shits and giggles, Right? When we get together, the conversation is always about what we're going to do next. What do we see? Not just the next move as to how we're going to spread the word, how we're going to make ourselves stronger, how we're going to build and develop the men. So I said, just stay out the way. Just stay out the way. Don't worry. God, in due time, will see if you're going to endure in this or not. But just be quiet and stay out the way or man up and get yourself ready for the battle and show it. We need brothers with this mindset. Come on. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Some of you, again, in that over-righteousness, you can't even. These brothers are over you in the spirit. When you were in that circle and you didn't know a damn, once upon a time, you didn't know nothing. And then once you know a little something, your head gets so big that now these guys ain't nothing to you. And I know that that goes all the way up to the top. And I don't really care what what you think about me, what you care about me. If you're sincere, then great. I appreciate it. You think anything negative, whatever, you murmur. and Go ahead. You saw what happened to them that murmured against Moses. And I'm surely not saying I'm Moses. But God knows who's putting in his spirit, who's putting in them real bricks, who's putting in that word. You want to roll in that spirit? You roll in that spirit. Remember, in that day, every idle word would be accounted for. When you sit in that judgment seat, God is going to show you yourself. If you never were able to see yourself while you had the mercy, the chance to do it, God is going to. See, I wanted to go into that. Mercy's not fulfilled to that day that you get that judgment. Some of y'all think that your mercy's been obtained. What you have is the grace period to get yourself together. Mercy is determined when you sit in that judgment seat. You cannot walk around like your salvation is sealed. Paul said, I finished my course. I fought the good fight. When you can die knowing that you stayed and did everything that the scripture said the right way, then you can die with boldness in your heart, saying, I'm ready to sit in that judgment seat. And I know I did some things wrong, but I know all the good that I did too. And I'm confident that I can stand there and I'll let God judge me in that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Christ will advocate for me in that day. Read this again. Remember them which have the rule over you, 
who have spoken unto you the word of God. Come on. Whose faith follow. It means you follow their examples of faith. Come on. Considering the end of their conversation. Considering that their end of their conversation was like what we read in Ephesians. That we may have utterance to speak boldly unto them that are out there. That have not heard that word. You have to consider their end and what the most high in Christ has in store for people like that. Remember the scripture says some of y'all might have entertained angels unaware. And remember I said all of us before you were formed in the womb. The Most High set up his agenda and your gifts inside of you. That soldier, that officer of 10 or 20 that you have no regard for and disrespect for, you don't know who he's ready to be manifest into and grown up into. There's, y'all don't have the faith to see this thing spiritually. It's, uh, it's the boys club. It's the girls club, it's the boy scouts, it's the girl scouts, it's, um, you're like the people that go to the gym to make friends and not really work out and change yourself. You know what I'm talking about, some of you are those people that go to the gym and just talk. I go to the gym, don't even look at me, I'm here to work out, I'm not here to make friends. Put my music on, I keep my eyes down, because I'm there to build myself. Some of y'all, you're here to make friends, some of you are here to find a husband, or a wife, some of you are here because, you know, maybe you felt, okay, the Christian church, you know, I kind of liked the culture and everything, I, you know, I just knew that I didn't want to worship a white Jesus, but here I could get black Christ and still get all the other social aspect of what I'm doing. Whatever it is, you got to work that thing out, and we need people who are going to be here that want to be about this battle, you know, right, that want to be about that. I had, like, another page and a half at least to go through. I'm going to cut it there. I'm just telling y'all, I came out of this Passover, and if you didn't come out of that ready to have boots on the ground, to build yourself up, to move forward. And I'm talking about you brothers that are fit for the battle, and those that aren't, it, at least come out of it with the zeal to know that you're in the right place, and there's no bloody gold to take something from scratch like this. I say you can't appreciate it. You can't appreciate walking in and, and not have, you, you have too much now. You have too much now to, to fully understand where we've come and not for ourselves to pat ourselves in our back, but to see the evidence of what the scripture said would always happen and to see that momentum build and to see that exceeding great army stand up. That should, that sh that should put something inside of you that just changes your whole mindset. Don't just let this be another Passover that goes by. Don't let the next day of atonement be another day of atonement that goes by. Some of you are sitting here and have atoned five years in a row and have bitterness and hatred in your heart for people that are right next to you. You're playing games. And though we cannot condemn you, be sure that you're going to sit in that judgment seat of Christ because we all must sit there. Uh, I, like I said, I got, I got more. It, it did not have the oomph that I wanted it to have because I have more and I want to go in more detail. But I had to get to the takeaway. And the takeaway is, are you ready for the battle? Are you really ready for what's to come? Are you really ready for the things to escalate to the level that they may escalate? Are you ready to see some of your leaders in jail? And if we're in jail, are you ready to pick that up? And Are you ready to see us dead? And then what happens if that happens? And the rest of you men aren't ready. Is that the end of what we've done? Israel United in Christ is just the name of what we have now. But the Israelites are rising in the earth. And we're moving and we're doing things. And it's not just preaching. So you got to get yourself ready. Are you ready for the battle?
nation is men leading by example. 